I want you to know thank you, Vessels of Honor, because we had intercessory prayer where we went against witchcraft, false prophets, spirits of infirmity, uh, spirits of divination, and our now shepherds. We came together and we had such an incredibly Holy Ghost filled intercessory prayer while they were still in Kenya. I want to thank you all for that. Thank you, Chairman Wheatley, for continuing to lead that post. People don't know that they, we know we look at the numbers and we look at Zoom, but let me tell you something. Vessels of Honor is strong. Vessels of Honor is strong. And I want you to start talking about how strong Vessels of Honor is. Vessels of Honor has people who are nevertheless obedient warriors who are responsible for three hours every day, every 86,400 seconds. We have eight watches that are covered by watch warriors who have teams, who have specific things. There are churches that if you tell them what that is, they don't even know. But we have to begin to applaud the work that we're doing because we are doing great things. I want somebody to say amen and agree with me that we are doing great things. We're not amen. just waiting. We get COVID has really uh, been a catalyst, not a cause. But it's been a catalyst that the enemy has used to make us forget who we are, not just who we want to be. Our mission is why we exist. Our vision is what we hope to attain. But we can never forget that we are doing our mission. We are doing it. I wish somebody would just say hallelujah to that. I'm telling you, we are almost three decades strong of Vessels of Honor doing our mission. We are constantly talking about what has to be done to help us reach our vision. But we are standing here because our mission remains strong. We are talking about the key of eternity and the doors of everlasting and the door of everlasting. That's why I talked about last year in introduction to this. And now I have to see if I'm the clicker. How do I do the clicker? Um, all right, you, we, we making it work. We are gonna make this thing work because I have the I have the message down in I have today's message as part of one slide deck. So that's why I have to uh, slide it down. But as you see here, just reminding you, Rosh Hashanah, the keys and principles. This is the year of the open door. And Joseph is the gatekeeper. And I am asking you to look at those characteristics of Joseph because that's what God needs us to step into that Joseph anointing in order to accomplish the things that God has for us. And Joseph was the least likely candidate to be able to accomplish the things that he accomplished. So I want to say to you, you may be the least likely candidate but God may have an entire nation with your name on it. So just look for that as a doorkeeper and as the gateway. So today I want to talk about get out of the pit and party because we have pity parties. So I'm going to ask you in the spirit of Joseph, just get out of the pit and party. You don't have to have a pity party. You just got to get out of the pit. So my goal is to help you today get out of the pit so you can party. Because we have forgotten that when the temple was built, whether it was David, you know, Solomon wasn't as good of a musician as his daddy was. But let me tell you, wherever you found David, if you found him repenting, if you found him winning wars, if you found him in solitude, David was jamming. David had an instrument when he was a little boy, the one that they couldn't even find. When, they, when the prophet came and said, you got to have somebody else. Come on, Jesse and I, they, there ain't nobody left but that little runt back there playing the harp, talking to sheep. But we know him as King David. So I want you to get excited about partying because David was a party. I want to talk about you getting your dance back because David was a dancer. He danced so, scripture tells us one of those times he came all out of his clothes dancing. 
I'm telling you, he played so, he would play music and he would play what we would probably now call a banjo or a ukulele, or we might, he might have called, we know he might have had a plugged in bass and a lead guitar. But what I can tell you is that he was a musician who celebrated. So when I use the word party, I don't want you to pollute it just because the enemy now dances and acts like if we dance, that we're doing something sinful. Dancing started with God. God is the one who allowed us to go forth. God is the one who has allowed us to celebrate. And I'm still, it's, it's, it's amazing to me how heavy that still feels when I say it. How we have gotten so ingrained into the cares of this world that when the world does something that belongs to us, that now they've done it so long that we act like they own it. You know how somebody borrows something of yours and then you don't go get it for a while and then you go to get your thing and they ask you, do you want to borrow it because they've decided it is now theirs? Well, church, we do that often with the world. We There are many things that belong to us and now we go as if we're borrowing it from the enemy and then when we bring it back into the church, now we have these nonsensical religious debates as to whether or not you should clap your hands or dance in church. It's ridiculous. Where do you think it started? So I want you to get out of the pit and start to party because there's partying to be done. And that is what we're going to talk about today. So let me, there are just seven pitfalls as pathways to partying. We got to keep the time straight. We're talking, you know my commitment. So you already know what I'm talking about for this next year. Today, I want to give you the location of the pit. And I want to give you the length of time that Joseph was in the pit. And I want to talk about what makes a pit a place to party. Because we can party without having a pity party. But we have to understand why a pity party is important because a pity party is when you get delivered out of the pit, but you party like you still in it. So we're not having no pity party. We just gonna get out of the pit and party. And that's what I want, I want you to grab a hold of because there are so many negative things that have happened and none of them measure up against the goodness of God. But we have escalated these little few dots, blemish, wrinkles, and we have made them so great that now we're partying in that pit. When truly, all we have to do is get out of the pit so we can part. Let us remember to do what David did. In the midst of however bad it got, he would write a song. We call them songs, and we've studied them, and we have written songs. The Holy Ghost has told Apostle Bowers to have us write our own songs. And we have, and we've sang our own songs. When we were in our small groups and we studied songs, we wrote songs, we wrote songs from the songs. Oh, we've forgotten that already too. So let me tell you, and then we were in the pit. We were in a COVID pit. We were saying, oh, when we get out, oh, when we get back to church, oh, I just can't wait to get back. So we got to get rid of the pit mentality so we can party. Why go to Goshen? I'm going to talk about that, the door of destiny. And if I have an opportunity, I just want to list a couple of things about the importance of forgiveness, because that leads us into the next opportunity that I will have to share with you, the Lord willing. So we have this year, 5784. It is a year of the door. It's a year of the open door. But the reason that we're saying the year of the door is to help us to understand if doors open, then what also has to happen? Doors then have to close, right? So if we are going to live in an open door season, then we have to be willing to let some doors close. The reason we stay in the pit and try to party from the pit is when we don't close doors that God said close, even though he's saying walk through the open door. So I want to challenge your thinking as you go through life 
I want you to start monitoring the doors God has closed in your life that you keep a crack in, even though you're asking him to open doors of abundance in your life. So sometimes that has absolutely nothing to do with God. It just has simply to do with we stuck our foot in the door as a doorstop. And instead of allowing that door to be closed, that God said it's time for it to close, we keep a little crack in the door. And next thing we know, it's not even because our brothers threw us in the pit anymore. It's because we decided to stay in the pit on our own. So we also have to stop blaming people for our pity parties. If you want to remain in a pit and have a party in the pit, then that's on you. And we do it many times, sometimes throughout the day. There are days I can't even tell you how many times I put myself out the pit. Because sometimes the pit feels comfortable. Mm -hmm. Nobody's there. You're, you're able to just be however you want to be, even though you're locked in, even though you're enslaved. But the truth is, God wants us to be free. So this is the second year of Joseph. So he's gone from Goshen to governor. I talked about this. This one is a repeat slide. I think the only one that I have, just because I wanted to reiterate in year 5783, which was 2022 and 23 for us, that was the year that Joseph went into Goshen when Joseph bought the majority of the land of Egypt in exchange for food so his family could be re reunited. That's so important right now because money means less and less by the second. However, in the city of Milwaukee, in the state of Wisconsin, in the country of the United States, there are so many food insecurities and food deserts that we have people dying of hunger in a country that throws away tons of food on a daily basis. Well, Joseph, instead of doing like we've done, oh, y'all didn't know that? I, yeah, I gotta make sure you keep up with me. I, I, I just felt like, like a dead spot right there. Yeah, I'm talking about in Milwaukee. In, let's just do Milwaukee. Let's just take away from the country. Let's do great in Milwaukee because we're in McDonald's. Do you know when I was 14 and worked at McDonald's and when my mom had my brother Carl work at Hardee's, and my brother Mike worked at King Crispy's after our dad passed, that we worked at those three places because each of us had a responsibility to be the one to close at whichever one of those food places we were working at. And then we got to bring the leftovers because that's what we ate for food. Yeah. So we knew what we were going to eat based on whose day it was to work their job. So uh, when I worked at... I worked at McDonald's and you had to write down everything, learn how to count change. I still know how to do that. I know that people don't even know what that is. You know, you writing down and ordering all of that. But we would be able to bring any leftover food home. And let me tell you, the best sandwich at McDonald's that just isn't on the menu is when you take one of those all beef patty, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onion, sesame seed bun. If you replace one of those beef patties with a fish fillet, you got a sandwich that a sale right now. You know, you say somebody will say a, a line and say that a preach. Let me tell you something: a fish fillet in as one of your patties in that Big Mac. You try it, that thing and eat real good. And we used to make those. I used to make them. And so and it, it was a, you had to buy both of them and put them together, but I worked there, so I knew how to do it. And I could, and instead of that sesame seed bun, if you use that nice, moist fish filet bun, oh, let me tell you, that's a sandwich to die for right now. <laughs> but what we did, even at that time, we all knew it was necessary for us to make a contribution to our household so we could eat. In Milwaukee, in, in the greater Milwaukee area today, 2023, we have zip codes that are considered food insecurities, which means there's some food but not enough. And then we have some zip codes that are actually in food deserts where food is absent. And we will still, in our city, arrest people for digging through garbage cans to find food. So, 
That's, does anybody feel that as a saint again? Does anybody feel the Holy Ghost in you? What does that make you feel like to know that? Well, let me tell you one of the big things that Joseph did when he got out of that pit. He used food to buy land. And he used food to buy the majority of Egypt. And then he housed his family in the best land in the country because he was able to use food. And right now, we're dealing with homeless and hungry all around us. In year 5784, the year of the door that we're in now, this is also a year of Joseph. I asked you last, last the time I was before you in September, are you a Joseph? Because this is a year of being called by name. Joseph is being called by name. So this is not a gender year. This is understanding that as an anointed leader, God is going to call you out by name. Some of you, he already is doing so. And he's telling you that he wants you to break through all of those past doors that have been closed. He's going to open those doors for you. The ones that you've been waiting to have open, God is going to open them for you. I wish I was preaching to some people that needed some doors open and not just folks that say it's so early to be here on a Sunday morning. Because I want you to know you ought to get real excited knowing that doors that have been closed in your life, that God is going to call you by name. And he's going to say, get up and go. Because that door that has been closed, I just opened it. This is not the time to want to finish your dream. This is not the time to finish watching whatever you're watching on YouTube. This is not the time to keep on texting. This is a time to get up and go. Because there are doors that have been closed in your life that are getting ready to be open. God's going to call you by name as if he did with Joseph. And he's going to say, get up. You're asking me for stuff, but you won't get up. It's the year of the door. Get up. And if you can't walk, then pick up your bed and walk. Don't tell me again that for 38 years you've laid there because somebody else got to the water first when it was trouble. That's all you've been dealing with? Is somebody tripping over you? Jesus just said it. Lord. He's saying to us, we're doing a lot of complaining and we're saying, oh, we ain't got enough to do this. How are we going to do this? How are we going to pay off this? He said, get up. Get, take up your bed and walk. Get to the door. Because when you get there, you're going to hear one slam. But that's because I'm closing the one that's been messing you up. I don't want you to pay attention to that loud noise of the door being slammed in your face. I want you to pay attention to the creak of the door that's open. And then I want you to walk through it because it got your name. Doors that you've been waiting to open. Anybody in here, anybody on Zoom been waiting on some doors? He's going to take us from the pit to Potiphar, prison to Pharaoh, provider to protector to perpetual, plentiful, providential, presidential prime minister. Woo. I typed it. I thought I could say that better last month. That was hard. <laughs> Joseph and his family, Joseph and his family come up, out, and through open doors in 5784. That's important because some of us want to divest family. And there are some families that you need to not be around. But I'm going to deal with that under forgiveness because even when there's not reconciliation, you don't get to, we don't get to, as the saints of God, we don't get to render evil for evil. Amen. Even if it's family, we don't get to render evil for evil. We still have to overcome evil with good. That don't mean that you gotta go sleep at nobody's house. That don't mean that you got to go on vacation where you know that when it pop off, it's going to pop off all the way. It just means that you have to get in an open door position so you understand your power to close doors. 
because the year of the door is not just God opening doors for you. He's giving you the power and kingdom keys to close doors and lock them and stay away from them and still love because you can. A pitiful purpose and a pompous proposition. Let's just look in Genesis 37, 23 through 28. I'm reading from the King James Version. And it came to pass when Joseph was coming to his brethren that they stripped Joseph out of his coat. He had the coat of many colors, the coat of many colors similar to uh, Jacob and Esau, the coat of many colors should have gone to the oldest person because it was actually a garment of birthright. But it was given by, by Jacob to Joseph. So his brothers, Joseph going, to, going through the story, I no longer can say you learned it in Sunday school because we haven't had Sunday school long enough, so I won't say that. I will just say that there was a time when Joseph's brothers went to take care of something. They didn't come back. Joseph being the second youngest of the 12, his father sent him to see if his brothers were okay. And he did find them. But the reaction of his brothers was that they stripped him out of his coat because there was already jealousy. They didn't put Joseph in a pit because he came to look for him. They put Joseph in the pit because they hated him at home. All right. You need to know when you hated at home. Because if you hate it at home, when people act a fool in public, it ain't because they see you in public, it's because they hate you at home. So they hated him at home. And when he went to do in obedience what his father said, had on this coat, ripped off the coat, they took him and they cast him into a pit. And the pit was empty and there was no water in it. So they put him in a place where he would not even be able to get water. They dropped him into a well that could have been uh, given consideration similar to when Jesus said, I must needs go through Samaria on his way to Jerusalem when the woman at the well didn't understand that the water that she was drawing out, that was still a dry well because she didn't understand Jesus. So Joseph, Brothers threw him in a pit, empty, no water. And then look at what they did. They sat down and they started eating. They didn't leave Joseph. They didn't run away when they threw him in the pit. They threw him in the pit and then they had a campfire. They sat around the pit and they ate with their brother in the pit. That's where they were at. And then they lifted up their eyes and their look and behold, a company of Ishmaelites. Ishmaelites, remember, Ishmael was that older son of Abraham, but he wasn't the chosen son. Well, these are the sons of the chosen son. So now, here come their cousins. It's the same thing that's going on today. I'm putting it into the context of historical scripture, but if you look at the war-torn the war -torn situation that's going on right now, you could take it right back to this pit. And you can learn a whole lot about what's going on right now right. if you just look at what happened at the pit. Because the brothers surrounded the pit, ate with their brother in the pit. Their cousins came by, who they already knew were their enemies. And they came from Gilead. They had their camels. They had all kinds of stuff, spices, balm, myrrh. They were on their way to Egypt. And Judah, not the country, but the son, the brother of Joseph, Judah said unto the rest of his brethren, Reuben would have been there the oldest. Judah said, so much, so much theology in that. I'm, I'm just working through not talking. I'm, I'm talking myself out of talking. What profit is it if we slay our brother? That's what Judah said. It's important to remember that's what Judah said. What profit is it if we slay our brother and then conceal his blood? Let's just sell him to the Ishmaelites. And then let not our hands be upon him. For he is our brother. So Judah said, you know, I don't know that we just want to let him be here and die. 
He is our brother. Let's just sell him to our cousins that can't ever come over for Thanksgiving and Christmas. You know we don't talk to them cousins. Y'all know who their name is. Y'all y'all know who it is right now, don't you? Who is that cousin that you ain't going to let come to your house? Thanksgiving is coming up. I'm not saying invite. I'm just saying that Ishmaelites, they had stuff with them. And Judah was smart enough to say, huh, maybe we shouldn't leave him here to die. Let's sell him to the Ishmaelites. He is our brother. And the rest of the brothers were content. These were 10 of the 12 brothers. So we're talking about 12 brothers and 10 of them making this conspiracy, this pitiful purpose and this pompous proposition. How dare they? Then there passed by Midianites, merchants, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit. And they sold Joseph to the Israelites and they sold him for 20 pieces of silver. And they then brought Joseph to Egypt. A lot of Christophanies, a lot of foreshadowing in that. So Joseph's brothers threw him in the pit, made a decision not to kill him, did make a meal though. And that's important because of how Joseph bought them back, made a meal and ate and then sold them to their cousins. He got sent to Egypt. Joseph, so now let's go back to the timeline. So keeping the time straight. Joseph was 17 when his brother sold him into slavery. He then lived in Egypt for 13 years. Between his time serving Potiphar, his time in prison, and his age of 30 when he was released from prison and then set over the land of Egypt. Was not clear as how much time, if any, passed between Joseph's promotion and the beginning of the seven years of plenty. But following the assumption that at least a partial year kind of crossed over and elapsed between Joseph's promotion and the spring of the first year of plenty, the last piece of the puzzle is where to date Jacob's arrival related to Joseph's age. Jacob, the daddy, what did he think now that his son was dead? Because they put some lamb's blood on that coat and took it home. So they still lied after they sat around, did a campfire, ate food, left him in the pit, sold him. They still went home and lied. So now, can't remember, keep putting So when Joseph is speaking to his brothers and extending the invitation for them to join him in Egypt, now he's out of the pit. He's been sold and all these evil things were supposed to happen. But all these great things were happening to him at a very young age. So when he started speaking to his brothers and extending the invitation for them to join him in Egypt, he states that two years of famine had passed and there were going to be seven years of famine. So five remained. So when they got hungry, and needed to be working at McDonald's, at Hardee's, and at King Crispy. King Crispy was the best because when they fried their fish, they served it to you dipped in vinegar. So I always wanted Mike to work more days during the week because I love King Crispy fish with the vinegar. So we all have these different, different things that we like. So Joseph, during a year of famine, says, oh, okay, I know who these cats are. They don't even know who I am. They didn't even, they didn't even recognize him. They didn't recognize, even though they knew. Here's something the Holy Ghost told me to give clarity to. The brothers were not surprised because they thought Joseph died. They knew Joseph lived because they sold him. So they weren't afraid of seeing a ghost. They knew they sold their brother. They knew they didn't kill their brother. They just didn't know that their brother had been promoted because he decided to come out of the pit and have a car. Right. Jacob's arrival, their dad, is seven years of plenty plus two years of famine, famine about nine years, maybe a little longer after Joseph had been promoted. This would make Joseph about 40 years old by the time he was 17 when he went to look for his brothers. So when you think about how long that had been 
since his dad had seen him. He was 17 and now he's 40. So we're looking at about 23 year span. Joseph ultimately lived to the age of 110 or an additional 70 years after Jacob's arrival to Egypt. So God also allowed Joseph to spend time with his father, despite how old they both were when they were reintroduced. We can also deduce that Jacob was 80 years old when Joseph was born, which supports the statement that when he was the child of Jacob's old age, and that Joseph's promotion coincides with the year of Isaac's death. Joseph's story starts at Genesis 37 and two, and this is 13 years before Isaac's death in Genesis 35. That's important for you to go back and just look at that timeline. I, I took the slide out to reduce complexity for now, and I'll bring it back at a different time. But instead, that's good. I had a slide in here about Moses, but instead, let me have you look at this slide. All right, so this is the Exodus route. Now, Goshen is here. And you all see Goshen? So there's Goshen. And here's Jerusalem over here. You see where I'm pointing, saying Jerusalem? Well, at the time of the Exodus, then it went this route. Here's the Red Sea. They would have crossed around here, did all of this before they got to Canaan. But look how interesting it is if you just look at where Joseph was and where God was trying to get the children. Look at that straight line. Isn't that amazing? I thought that was a better visual than me putting into words what I'm getting ready to say. It's important for you to understand that Joseph's story, all of this happened. It was a place where Egypt was kept as a place of protection. It was a place of beginning. It was a place where God started a bunch of stuff. Right. That's how we can remember that Joseph was part of the beginning. Joseph was part of the Genesis account. So we don't have to get him confused with, but what about Moses? Because Moses came in at the Exodus. So Genesis, it started, let's stay. Exodus was, oh, we got to get up and out of here. So remember, connect Moses with the Exodus of having to leave this area and go around here. But before any of that happened, all of this stuff happened in Goshen with Joseph. So keeping those stories, they're not like this. They're not, and neither are they linear and simultaneous. The work that Joseph did was a precursor to Moses being able to do an exodus. So there had to be doors closed in order for the exodus door to be open. Are you with me on that? And Goshen en route actually, um, when you follow the route, passes through Damascus, another just incredible part to align the work of Jesus Christ. So we look at that map, let's do another pictorial. So here, just to let you see, and you know you will have access to anything that I provide, you have access, but here you can see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So when you get Jacob, Jacob had a bunch of kids, had two wives, Joseph by the favorite. So here's Joseph comes in right here. And then Joseph lives here across that blue line. What I want to show you is down here. Can you see this little, it's like green and gold or something. These little boxes, they show the seven years of plenty and the seven years of lean. And then this shows you that Jacob lived in the midst of that time. This is about a 200 year total. Look at that slide later when you have time to look at it. What I wanna show you just to underscore what I said is this is now Moses. So what happened in at the first chapter of Exodus and the eighth verse, it says, and there arose a new king in Egypt who did not know Joseph. 
Let me tell you, we want to live in a time where we know Joseph. I hope I'm looking at some Joseph because we need Joseph because there's going to come a time when it's going to be a king and that king ain't going to know Joseph. So we need the king to know Joseph today. So let us now teach Chloe another word. Are you willing to be a Joseph? Uh, you know, y'all trust y'all trust Chloe more than me. That's all right. That's all right. I just want you to know that being Joseph is a tall order. But if if you're not willing to be one, then that means you're just willing to wait for someone to be one. So you're willing to stay in the pit and have a pity party instead of being a Joseph that can get out of the pit and party. Well. I don't know, Dr. Bowers, depends on the day you ask me, because you just said he went through a whole lot, a whole lot. And then none of it sounded fun. So we got to decide. Are we soldiers in the army of the Lord? Or are we just having appetites serocified at the table of the Lord? Why go shoot? The land of Goshen is an area in Egypt. So we're still talking about Egypt where the Israelites lived for over 400 years. Joseph, Jacob's son, we talked about that. You already have that, I'm giving that to you so you have it. When famine plagued the area, Jacob, who's also Israel, sent some of his sons to Egypt to purchase food. We already know that the way that Joseph ended up buying most of Egypt was through food. His brothers came to try to buy food because they were experiencing what Milwaukee is experiencing now. They were experiencing a food insecurity. So they had to travel to get food. And they were going to pay for it. Eventually, Joseph revealed his identity to his brothers and convinced the family to move to Egypt. So even in the midst of all of the things that his family had done to him, he kept his eye on Jerusalem so he could stay focused on his assignment. So he knew his purpose, his purpose being God's purpose that God did on purpose, meant that he had to show mercy in the face of those who showed no mercy to him. My Lord. But he revealed his identity. I wonder what they would have looked like. Just think about one of them boys. I wonder what Naphtali looked like. I wonder what Reuben looked like. I wonder what Dan looked like. What do you think Judah looked like when they had to realize, this is my brother? What would that feeling have been for you? You're hungry. You're trying to buy food. You got a daddy that's dying because there ain't nothing to eat. You got a baby brother that's gone. You got, you got another brother that's a secret that we can't talk about because he's been a secret for decades. We've been carrying a lie for decades. And God is saying, it's time to shut the door of that lie. There are families that are stuck in places because the narrative was changed Somebody had a campfire while the victim was in a pit and agreed to a decade-long lie. And then you, Joseph, you, you, Joseph, gave him something to eat. When Israel's family got there, Pharaoh gave him the area east of the lower Nile, and that was called Goshen. And it was, a, it was an excellent piece of property. They could do their livestock. They could raise their children. The soil was fertile. It was ideal for pasturing animals. And Pharaoh entrusted his own real livestock to the Israelites. Why? Not because of Isaac, not because of Reuben, not because of Dan, not because of Naphtali, but because of who? Oh, uh, yeah, y'all ain't him yet. We getting there. Because, see, <laughs> it's a problem. It's a problem if our family is waiting on us to be Joseph. It's a problem if we're not willing to be Joseph. It's a problem if we are Joseph, but we're not willing to be the Joseph that has a Jesus heart. Oh, Lord. 
So maybe you don't want to be Joseph, but are you willing to have Jesus' heart put inside of you, Joseph? So not only was Goshen a fertile land, but it was on the eastern edge of Egypt in the direction of the land of Canaan. And I showed you that from which the Israelites had come as well as being a distance away from Pharaoh and the seat of power. The occupation of shepherding was detestable to Egyptians. So in the way Pharaoh could keep these foreign herders away from him and his glory while still making sure he got some meat, he got some wool. Goshen became this land where people prospered. So Goshen is considered a land of prosperity. And some even like to akin it to Eden as that go back place of fertility. People of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceeding strong so that the land was filled with them. Many generations later, a new Pharaoh rose to power. And that Pharaoh didn't know Joseph. So why do you need to work while it is day? Because the scripture lets us know that when night comes, is what? So when night comes, don't mean you're going to die. Night coming might just mean it's a new Pharaoh that ain't going to remember you. Why is it important for you to be Joseph in the season of Joseph? Is because one day there's going to be a Pharaoh who's not going to know who you are. So you have to work the work of him who sent you while it is day, while you are anointed, while you have strength, while you know right from wrong. You have to be willing to be the Joseph before Pharaoh comes who's not going to remember who you are. So why is now important? Now is important because down yonder is on its way. Hmm. Where are you, Joseph? Why Goshen? The Egyptians began to fear the Israelites so you start seeing oppression happen. You start seeing the plagues happen. This second bullet point I wanted to put in here because God brought plagues on Egypt as part of the process of liberating his people. I'm gonna say it again because I know that's hard when you hear it the first time. God brought plagues on Egypt as part of the process of liberating his people. And what I would put before the period is his people in Egypt. God brought plagues on Egypt as part of the process of liberating his people who were in Egypt. Before the fourth plague, which was the plague of flies, God declared, but on that day, I will set apart the land of Goshen. So there are times, COVID, that God really does set us apart. God will put us in Goshen when diseases are coming that are destroying our land. God will carve out a Goshen so that you can prosper when no one else is. God will anoint you as Joseph and he will give you plenty when the rest of your family has nothing, but God has to depend on you willing to be carved out Goshen even though you don't want everybody to think that you are that, but you are that. We got to get comfortable being all that. We have to get comfortable being Goshen. We have to get comfortable when the plumbing comes that God said, but I'm going to send you in Goshen because I'm honoring you, Joseph. And when that plumbing comes, it's not going to come nigh you. God declared, but on that day I'll set apart the land of Goshen where my people dwell so that no swarms of flies shall be there. Y'all read that with me, that you may know that I am the Lord. What's so powerful are, are the words that come after that. I am the Lord. Am I slide here? Yeah, no. Okay, I'm the right place. I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. I can bring swarms of flies, but I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. So Goshen 
was, was very important. And instead of remembering the land of Goshen as a place where God proved his ability to provide and displayed his trustworthiness to redeem, the people imagined Goshen as a place of prosperity where there was no need to trust God. So what happens is, oh, anybody you bless me, Lord, I'll be satisfied. I remember the time that we went through church and we were talking about poverty and we had people come up to me and Apostle Bowers and say, it's hard for us to keep coming to church, listening to you to talk, talk about people who don't have stuff because some of us got stuff. Some of us got money. People came and told us that. We need you to preach something about that ain't just about getting folks out of debt because we ain't in debt. We got money. We have plenty. We have lived to hear that from members. What we have to recognize is when God then prospers us, we cannot say, now I don't need to trust you. So when trusting God becomes difficult, I want you to start to see if it's harder to trust God in your Goshen time of plenty than it is in your time of famine. Is it harder to trust God when you're Joseph in Goshen? than it is if you're Joseph in the pit. There's one other place called Goshen in the Bible. It's a city defeated by Joshua and the Israelites on the southern border of Judah in Palestine and given to the tribe of Judah. So biblical readers see the land of Goshen as a place that can teach us of God's trustworthy character. We do a lot of preaching and we preach a lot of good stuff. And I am biased because I listen to a whole lot of preaching and Vessels of Honor has some that is second to none. We have excellent preaching and teaching. But we see now that some readers see Goshen as a place that can be teach worthy of God's trustworthy character and also as a warning against allowing past experiences to tempt us away from walking faithfully with the Lord. So the important part of that is not only is it important to get out of the pit, this reinforces how important it is to pardon. Because if you will not give God glory, if you will not worship, if you will not dance before him, if you won't pick up a tambourine on the way across the Red Sea, you can get to the point to where you have forgotten what God has done for you. And as soon as you stop celebrating God, you will start blaming God for your current condition instead of celebrating what he's brought you out of. Hallelujah. Doors of destiny. I'm about to be done with you all for today. I talked about this. I'm doing a, this is a quick one. A door is defined as an entrance or an exit point between two areas, typically used to separate spaces. But doors can bring opposition. Persistent prayer can cause doors to shut or open. Importunity, meaning I'm gonna keep knocking, I'm gonna keep knocking, moves doors to open and close. Scripture teaches us, knock and it will be opened unto you. Some of us have doors that are already open. We just ain't not. Doors have divine timing. If there's a time lock on the door, then the door can't open until it's appointed time. Some doors can be dangerous and lead to sin. And some doors are of the enemy. Doors can engage and cease warfare. And saints, some doors are counterfeit. So, Today, I want to end almost in, almost in a shift, kind of a, a shift, but I want to end today's message on forgiveness. And of the many scriptures I could pull, let's just do Matthew 6, 14 through 16. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Moreover, 
when you fast. Don't be like hypocrites of a sad countenance. They just disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. I want you to fight for forgiveness. Fight to keep a spirit of forgiveness. It's the last slide that I'm doing today, but it may be the most important point. Famine, insecurities, deserts, hatred, selling brothers, carrying lies for decades, recognizing that you're wrong, but being willing to live behind the shadow and put a figure up of right. Inability to repent because of what somebody else might say or simply because you promised God you wouldn't do it again. What I want you to do more than anything between now and when I'm able to stand up here before you again, I want you to fight for forgiveness. All right. And when I say that, we're living in a time of unforgiveness. People are unforgiving. Mm -hmm. People are relentlessly unforgiving. People will watch elderly try to cross the street with a walker and won't stop them from getting run over. We live in a time where if somebody ever did anything to you wrong and you happened to cross, then now it may end in bloodshed. We are living in a time of unforgiveness so much and so that we won't even listen to the other party's side. We have decided the narrative that we heard was the correct one and we won't even allow the narrative to be challenged because we are gaining this spirit of unforgiveness. We must hold on to our spirit of forgiveness and the first thing is forgive yourself. Just take 15 seconds and think of, see if you can think of five things you haven't forgiven yourself of yet. Things that you still haven't forgiven yourself of. And now, right here and right now, I want you to forgive you. I want you to ask God to forgive you. I don't want you to go beg the pardon of whoever you wronged. I just want you right here and right now to forgive yourself for those five things that you thought of that you haven't forgiven yourself for yet. Forgive yourself. You know why? Forgiveness is the greatest key to your open door policy. If you truly want to get the treasures of Goshen, if you truly want to be able to not have a pity party, even though it's been years since you've been in the pit, then you have to learn how to party because you are forgiven. Oh, I feel the pressure. I know it's hard, but I need you to forgive yourself so that you can forgive others. And that's whether or not you ever reconcile. You may not see him again. In fact, you may need to forgive somebody who's already dead. That don't mean you commit suicide to go see him to tell him. It won't work. If you have not forgiven someone who you can never get in touch with again, forgive them. And forgive yourself for not forgiving them. I am preaching such an anointed revival of liberty word right now if I'll ever raise my voice one time. This season of lack of forgiveness is destroying our families, is destroying our health, is destroying our world, is destroying our mind. Behavioral health is real. Mental illness is an illness. And much of it stems from a lack of forgiveness, as does diabetes, as does high blood pressure, as does congestive heart failure. Sickness can be linked to your inability to forgive. Because guilt destroys healthy cells in your brain, in your gut, in your heart. You can work out and drop dead of a massive heart attack and it'll never be on your death certificate. 
But when you see Jesus, he may say, yeah, you went out because you wouldn't forgive. So I'm ending pressing on forgiveness. I want you to uncover the weights and the sins that are preventing you from forgiving. You got some. We all got some. As Elder James said, we often preach similarly. They come to me first. But what are the weights and the sins that are keeping you from forgiving? What are the weights and sins in your life that are keeping you from forgiving someone else and from forgiving yourself? What is it? What is the weight? What is the sin? I'm not here to preach it to you. I'm not here to call you out. I'm not here to make you feel bad. I'm not here to say, I see it. There it is. Come up on out of here. No. I'm saying to you, it's time for you to address and uncover the weights and the sins that are preventing you from forgiving, from forgiving yourself and your worst enemy. Because 